Signals are often processed or manipulated using digital systems. So in this video, we're going to discuss some of the components involved in using a digital computer to process continuous time signals. We're also going to introduce a commonly used processing technique, and that is filtering. Here we have a block diagram depicting an overall processing system where there's a continuous time signal x of t that's at the input and then we're going to sample that signal using an analog to digital converter to obtain a discrete time signal x of n. That signal is processed by a computing system that modifies the input x of n to meet some goal and then the output y of n may be converted in some cases back to a continuous time signal or it's possible that y of n itself is stored in digital form. Now anytime you sample signals you have the potential for aliasing. Typically an analog low pass filter is used to prevent aliasing and that limits the highest frequency that's presented to the A to D when the signal is sampled. So this is an analog system and that means it's constructed from analog components like op amps, capacitors, resistors, and so on. Well, let's look at some examples. X of T could be an audio signal, in which case the A to D is sampling the output of one or more microphones. The signal processing system may be combining or mixing the signals from different microphones, and it may also be shaping the spectrum of those signals. For example, introducing a bass boost or some other modification that sounds good. Now we may choose to store this signal in say an MP3 format, in which case the system is done. Now if this system is used at a concert or some other live event where we want to play back the processed sound, then we would be converting the output of the signal processing system, Y of N, back to a continuous time signal. As a second example, we could consider an autonomous vehicle. In this case, there's actually a lot of input signals that are available. We're going to be sampling the output of these different sensors, so the radar, cameras, and so on. And then the signal processing system is going to analyze the scene and make decisions regarding actions that should be taken. And we'll have output signals that affect the steering, turn signals, braking, acceleration, and so on. The second example is another case where we want to do this with negligible delay because if there's a long delay that's imposed by the signal processing system, we aren't going to be able to react to changes in traffic and road conditions to give appropriate vehicle control commands. So if we look at a signal processing system, the part that's implemented with a digital computer, it uses an algorithm or a set of rules that relate the output signal to an input signal. And there are a lot of different possibilities depending on the application for what that signal processing system might implement. For example, in image compression, we're going to be taking an image consisting of RGB values from a set of pixels. We're going to want to reduce that to a set of coefficients such as are associated with JPEG that take up a lot less space. We maybe have another system where we want to reduce the noise that's present in a signal. Or we may want to shape the spectrum of the signal by emphasizing bass or boosting the treble. And there's just a lot of different possibilities here for a signal processing system. One particular example that is very common is the idea of a filter. Now a filter separates signals. So it's going to block some signals and pass other signals. And this separation is performed based on some property associated with the signal. Frequency selective filters perform this separation on the basis of frequency. So if I have a low pass filter, that filter is going to pass the low frequencies depicted here in green and it's going to attenuate the high frequencies. And note that we're only showing the discrete time frequencies from minus 0.5 to 0.5 cycles per sample because discrete time frequency is not unique outside of this interval. 
So attenuating the high frequencies involves attenuating signals that have frequencies up to 0.5 cycles per sample. A high pass filter does in some sense the reverse. It attenuates, marked by the red here, signals that have lower frequencies and it's going to pass signals that have higher frequencies as noted by the green on both the negative and positive frequency axes. Whereas a band pass filter is going to pass a band of frequencies in the signal and it's going to stop the lower frequencies and the higher frequencies. So notice that these systems, uh, low pass, high pass, band pass filters, are discriminating or separating signals on the basis of the frequencies that are contained in those signals. Now one particular type of filter is a moving average or finite impulse response filter. Now the reason for the term finite impulse response will be apparent later when we talk about the impulse response. So this is a system that takes in an input x and produces an output y and the relationship between the output y and the input x is given by this equation. It says that y is equal to some coefficient b0 times x of n plus another coefficient b1 times x of n minus 1 and so on up to b sub m times x of n minus m. So this filter has coefficients b0 through bm a total of capital M plus 1, and those coefficients determine the filtering characteristic of this particular system. So here's an example where we have y of n is 1 fourth x of n plus 1 fourth x of n minus 1 plus 1 fourth x of n minus 2 plus 1 fourth x of n minus 3. In this case, capital M is 3. That's the largest delay associated with the input x of n. So we have x of n minus m, and here n minus 3. That's the largest delay. So we have coefficients b0, b1, b2, b3, and those are all 1 fourth. Now we can factor out the 1 fourth in this case and rewrite y of n as the average of the four most recent inputs. At time n, I take the four most recent values of the input. That would be x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus 2, and x minus 3. I form the average of those. The reason that these types of filters are called moving average because the averaging of the input signal moves as n changes. So if n equals 10, then I'm averaging x of 10 through x of 7. When n is equal to 11, I'm averaging x of 11 through x of 8. When n is equal to 12, we're averaging x of 12 through x of 9, and so on. So the average moves as n moves. And in this case, we have a very strict average, as we conventionally understand averaging, to take a sum of things and then divide by the number of terms in the sum. But even in the case where these coefficients are not all the same, and we're strictly averaging, this type of filter is called a moving average. It's sort of a generalization of averaging when we have coefficients that aren't identical. We'll consider an example of this system to see what it does, and I'm going to apply an input signal to this system that consists of two components. One component has frequency 0.05 and that's depicted here in the spectrum. And then the other component has frequency 0.45, so that's shown on the right in the spectrum. So the graph here shows 50 samples of this particular input signal. And you can see there's a lot of fluctuations because of the high frequency terms here, and there appears to be some underlying trend that might be associated with this low frequency term. If I apply this input to my averaging system, we obtain the output that's shown in the graph on the right. And you can see that the high frequency fluctuations are greatly reduced. And you can identify the lower frequency signal that's associated with 0.05 cycles per sample.
So this system, this averaging, smooths out the high frequency fluctuations. And in this particular case, this would be a low pass filter. Now, if we chose the coefficients differently, we could have this system be such that it gets rid of the slower trends. In other words, the low frequency terms and tends to eliminate those while preserving the high frequency term, in which case our output signal would have fairly fast fluctuations and be dominated by that. The problem of choosing those coefficients, the Bs, so that you achieve a particular filtering characteristic is known as filter design. And that's a topic that will be discussed later.